On July 2nd, 1947, an unidentified aerial craft crashed on a ranch outside Corona, New Mexico, about 75 miles northwest of Roswell. The debris covered an area of several hundred thousand square feet. It was discovered the next morning by the ranch foreman, William W. Mac Brazel. Brazel's son, Bill, described what his father found. According to my dad, there was a bad thunderstorm the night before, and the next day he was out on the ranch, and he found this debris. And he picked it all up in his pickup and was talking to people, and of course there was some talk about UFOs. He was going to Roswell, and as far as I know, he got in touch with the Sheriff's Department. They, in turn, called the Air Force. Then the Air Force got with Dad and uh, swore him to secrecy, and they came out to the ranch and picked up this debris. Wood, I call it wood. I don't know what it was. It was something like balsa wood, but uh, it wouldn't burn, and I couldn't cut it with my knife. Mac Brazel brought a piece of the material to his closest neighbor. The piece he brought up was like a kind of a tan, light brown, Plastic is what it looked like. It was more plastic now back then. It didn't have any plastic <laughs> that I knew of. And then it, uh, there was something he described as uh, tape. He said kind of like a piece of tape that had printing on it. It wasn't, wasn't uh, writing as we knew it, and it wasn't Japanese writing, you know, it suggested maybe that it might have been a Japanese book or something. He said the writing wasn't like Japanese writing, that it was, I imagine, more like hieroglyphics or something like that, the way he described it. Brazel brought some of the material to the sheriff's office in Roswell. While there, he spoke by phone with an announcer for KGFL Radio. So I got a call from a man who, uh, on the ranch, now once again we're going to get into something here, uh, I don't try to go into details about what he said to me or what I believe he said, but he was reporting some uh, uh, wreckage, let's call it wreckage, on his ranch, and he asked me, and he was quite a, well, I, I guess I could say upset, he asked me what to do about it. And I recommended that he talk to all these. After listening to some of the things he was saying, he's saying uh, certain things which uh, I really would ordinarily be very skeptical about. You know, when you work at a radio station, TV station, you get all sorts of calls from uh, people, and uh, some of them uh, may be a little strange. <clears throat> so I recommended, just generally speaking here, without trying to go into a lot of details, that he go to certain authorities. And I finally got him around to, I suggested that with whatever he was talking to me about, <clears throat> that he contact the Roswell Army Air Force Base. As I said, they're flyers, they'll know what to do about anything that flies. And um, so that was the first part of the, how this story gets started. Chavez County Sheriff George Wilcox sent deputies out to the Brazel Ranch to investigate. So you've read about this flying saucer incident in the, in the newspaper you went and asked your father him, about it. Asked him about it. And, uh, what did he tell you? And um, I asked him, uh, do you think this is true? And uh, he said, I don't know why Grandpa would have come all the way in here and brought that stuff if it hadn't been something important. And that he didn't, that he had to be something that he thought. And he had sent deputies out to see about it. What happened? Did he send, and he sent the, sent the deputies And out? he sent the deputies out. And <clears throat> I think I'm of the opinion that he sent the deputies out once. And that they um, saw a large um, black area, blackened area, the brass, the range land. 
and that they came back because it was dark. And then when he, when they came back, he had to wait till the next day to send them back again to find something else. And when they went back again, uh, the army had blocked it off and would, didn't let them in. When we arrived, why, uh, I noticed that there were jeeps and some people, you know, from the Air Force there. And, uh, of course, I went right in with my small child, and my husband, Jay, went into the office, and he said to my father, what's going on, George? And he said, well, we've had a man come in uh, saying that there is a fine saucer and bringing a piece of things and said, uh, I don't know what it is and said we were investigating it and uh, he said uh, what was it and he said well uh, it looked like a burnt grass it looked like burnt grass out there but as the years went along mother would always say and i also know of an article that she wrote that said uh, we do not as to this day know that there, whether it was a flying saucer or what, because they told us, my husband, Mr. Wilcox, that she would say, don't you say a word. So he didn't, and he was very calm about it. I mean, he just didn't say anything. Who told him not to say the word? Uh, the Air Force did. When they came and picked up the piece or whatever they did, she said they uh, recommended him. That's what the words were in the little article she wrote. However, there was more to the story, according to Sheriff Wilcox's granddaughter. My grandmother was Inez Wilcox, and my grandfather was George Wilcox, who was sheriff in, uh, in Roswell, New Mexico, at the time of the Roswell incident. All right. And you say you lived with your grandmother? Yes, I lived with her, um, well, I lived with her one whole year, and I taught at the New Mexico Military Institute, and then I lived with her three years, and then off and on. She helped finance me and support me and go to college. She helped me go to college. Did she ever discuss uh, events at Roswell with you? One evening we were watching TV and it was uh, on TV there was something about space. And my grandmother looked over at me and she said, Barbara, do you believe in anything, you know, outside of the earth? And I said, you know I do. And she said, well, I have something that I would really like to tell you, but I don't want you to ever discuss this or tell anyone because I've never told anybody. She just wrote an article one time and put flying saucer on it and that's all she had ever written down on a piece of paper. And I said, fine, what do, we, what do you need to tell me? And she, you know, I, I thought it was going to be something completely different than what she told me. And she said, uh, in the 40s, there was a spacecraft, a flying saucer is what she and mom called it, a crash outside of Roswell. I said, how do you know about it, Big Mom? And she said, your grandfather, George, was in the sheriff at the time. And I said, what? Well, I didn't have any idea. I said, what more about it? And it, she was very hesitant to talk about it, but you knew that within her, there was something that she really needed to tell me. And she sat there for quite a while, and then she looked at me, and she said, I'm just going to tell you. And she said, but don't tell anybody. And I said, who would I tell anyway? I don't know anybody to tell. And she said, the reason why I'm telling you this is because when the incident happened, the military police came to the courthouse, to the jailhouse, and told George and I that if we ever told anything about this incident, talked about it in any way, that not only we would be killed, but the family, that they would, cut, they would get the rest of the family. She was there and witnessed the police, the yes, military come was, in? Yes, when she, she was standing there with my grandfather. I said, did you hear them say that, big mom? That's what I called mm -hmm. them. And she said, yes, I did, Barbara. And she said, that's exactly what they told us. You know, told us. And I said, why? What did he know? And did she tell you what? Yes, yes. I said, you know, how could, what could you have known? That what happened is my grandmother said that they called my grandfather. Whether they called him on the telephone, came to the office, they lived there at the at the courthouse. They your, lived, your grandparents? Yes, they lived in the jailhouse, right. I guess. Okay. And someone came and told my grandfather of this incident that had happened outside of Roswell. My grandmother stated that my grandfather went out there to the site. When he got out there, there was a big burned area. 
when they first approached the area. And then they saw debris. He saw debris. I don't know if he was alone. She was not with him. He went by himself. She said that it was kind of like in the evening. And then he, when he came back, he, uh, she asked her if it, you know, out of jokingness, did he see any little space beings? And she said, yes, there were four of them. And I asked her, I said, what did they have on Big Mom? And she said that they had on a, they were like gray. And Granddaddy said their heads were large. And the little suit that they had on was, you, you couldn't, it was like um, silk or something, like that kind of material. But it was, they were gray. And I asked her what happened after that. And she said he came back into town and they, I guess they had discussed this incident, and they had thought it was fine to put it over the news, to talk about it, and then apparently something happened, and it was not okay. And that's when he started, Great Big Mom said he got phone calls from all over the world, England. People were calling him, talking to him, uh, asking him about the situation, and that, and he had been visited. And when they knew that he had gone out there, and seen the sight and seen this situation that they had talked about. Big Mom said that they were on him like you wouldn't believe. And they came into the jailhouse and told him, you don't say anything, George. And if you do, you will die, and so will Inez and the children and those children. And I said, did you believe him? And she said, what do you think? You know, when someone's telling you, and they have fear in their voice, and they're talking to you, and they're a person that you really love and you really care about, and she was honest. And you know, she was some of this, and if she would have told me she killed somebody, I wouldn't know. You know, so that's what she said, and and I believed her, and I know that she was telling the truth. And that's all she said, and I asked her, I said, Is, were the little men alive? Were they dead? And she said, I think of one of them was alive. And I said, Did Granddaddy help him, or what happened? And she said, I don't know. And that was that. And that's all we know. That she didn't tell me about anything else. The Roswell Base Intelligence Officer, Jesse Marcel, was sent to the Brazel Ranch along with Counterintelligence Corps Officer Sheridan Cabot. There, they recovered a sizable amount of very unusual debris. I found one piece of metal, what looked like metal anyway. It was not flexible, but it was as thin as a fall of a pack of cigarettes. It was that thin. One of my boys told me, said, there's something unusual here. He said, uh, I tried to make a dent in this metal. And he says, you can't bend it. You can't make a mark on it. He says, I took a sledgehammer and I whammed it. I put it on the ground and whammed it. And the, sledge <laughs> the sledgehammer bounced off of it. Before arriving at the base, he stopped at his house and awoke his wife and son, Jesse, who was 11 years old at the time. I want to say it was very early hours. It was either very late in the evening or very early in the morning. Uh, and uh, I had to wake both myself and my mother. And why did he wake you, wake you both up? He had something he wanted to show us. This uh, apparently was some debris or something he brought in from the field uh, at that time. And I understand he was on his way to the air base to deliver this, but he felt that this was unusual enough that he wanted us to see it first before he delivered it to his proper destination. And what happened uh, What happened after he woke you up? Well, he was, uh, as I recall, very excited. And uh, again, he said, I want to show you something. And uh, uh, so I got my, my house coat on with my mother. And uh, he had gone out to the car and brought back in some metallic debris. I believe it was in a box. I know. It, I don't recall whether I walked outside with him or not, but uh, he made it seem like the, the 1942 Buick we had was loaded with the stuff uh, in the back seat and in the trunk area. At any rate, uh, he brought the material in and spread it on the kitchen floor and uh, in an effort to try to piece it together like a jigsaw puzzle to get some idea of the form of this, but unfortunately there was too much of it, too finely divided. There was a lot of rather thick foil-like material, uh, kind of a 
not a uh, shiny aluminum, but uh, burnished or a uh, slate gray type of aluminum metal. Uh, there was a black plastic type debris, like Bakelite, which was shattered. It was very brittle material. And then there were uh, fragments of what appeared to be I-beams. Uh, relatively small, but uh, the typical I-beam type configuration. Anything else unusual about this particular piece of material? Well, the most unusual part of this whole thing was what was on the I-beam, on the inner surface of the I-beam. Because uh, as you look at it head on, there appeared to be a type of writing in the, on the mainframe itself. Uh, this writing was uh, definitely a purplish violet hue. Uh, it did have uh, an embossed appearance because you could, if I recall, you could rub your finger along it and you could tell it, it had texture. Uh, I don't recall any seeing any lines or letters of any kind, but it was more like geometric shapes. Or, well, it's hard to describe it. It was a curved, curved geometric shapes. There might have been some triangles and circles, but uh, uh, it was solid. Is it possible you might have mistaken it for Russian, Japanese, any other uh, language? No, no way. Master Sergeant Lewis Rickett returned to the Brazel Ranch with Cabot. Right after that, they had some stop point to ask the military police there. They had a number of them scattered all around, and we it looked like to me that there's something that they said that had landed and there was a little pipe with things lying all around. And I asked Cabot, I said, What's going on? He said, Well, that's why we're, this is what the guy said, something landed here, it is, but he saw it when he came out here. So uh, they had. Air police scattered all the way around the perimeter, and it's, the whole thing was down below the, the level of the rise. And it was just like a kind of depression to the. It was a natural depression. It wasn't a, that thing didn't cause it. did cause a little bit, but the material that we saw, this looked like it, it had, whatever it caused it, it was just like whatever there. It was just uh, vaporized. It was nothing jagged. It wasn't cut. It just like it was been a big piece and was just some minor pieces. But some of them were curved. Some of them were flat. They, uh, I know that I walked around to the other side over the distance and up to where the air police, where the, at that time it was the military police with the Provo Marshal's office. And they were, had kind of a semi drive out there allowing nobody in or out. And they gathered up that stuff as far as I can remember. And I knew that it just as, it wasn't pliable, it was just as hard as you could be and just as light as that. And uh, it was uh, enough there that they put some in a, uh, I don't know what kind of, some kind of weapons carrier, I think they called it, or a truck that the military had, and they put it in there, and the major took it with him. I know that we, if I can recall, I, I think that we had some, and that we had to bust it up. It wasn't a big pack at all, but I know that plane came in, and I think I knew the pilot that was on it, he looked at me, and I knew him, and he knew me, but he just shook his head as though he didn't want me to recognize, recognize him. So, so he just wanted to know something about a package, and at this time, Kevin was running the whole thing, and uh, they left. I heard various other sources that I'm not sure about, but I do know that later on, uh, I asked Joe Worth, who was head of the Kim Hunter CIC, and uh, whatever happened to all that metal, he said, that 
Lucia wouldn't ask me that. He said, but it is. We sent it over to a lab, and they don't know either or something. While Brazel was in Roswell, he was interviewed again by KGFL Radio. I don't know whether I should say this or not, but it was true. We hid off the rancher for one night. Where? Where? Yeah. where? Yes, and we, we, did a, we did some transcriptions with him and so mm -hmm. forth. Good old wire recorders, if you will. Where did you hide him out? We had him out at Mr. Whitmore's house here in town. He lived out outside of the city limits on the east side. You were present at the actual interview? I was not. You were not right? I was trying to run the station at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. The question that we, that we ran into is the very next morning, some friendly person, probably from Clinton Anderson's office, called us from Washington and said, you are, we, we understand that you have some information, and we want to assure you that if you release it on this matter, because it's not supposed to be released, it's very possible that your license could be in jeopardy. And so we suggest that you not do it. And he said, when I mean in jeopardy, like maybe three days. I think the next significant thing, as far as I'm concerned, it was dark. I got a phone call again. That's Brazil. And he is saying in a very clear voice, you know, very, very loud, <clears throat> well, look, uh, this story is... Um, you know, we haven't quite got this story right, and I don't know whether it was that night or the next night. See, that's what I'm saying. <clears throat> he wanted to come over and talk to me. So I said, okay, come over to the station. And that's where I said, look, <clears throat> you know, it's a very interesting story or something in effect, and, and uh, however, it's nothing at all like, or it's completely different from uh, the story you told me on the phone the other day, especially about something, I, uh, you know, of the little, where I said to him, the little green men, and that's where he said, yeah, it, only they weren't green. In the meantime, at KOAT Radio in Albuquerque, Lydia Sleppy received an urgent phone call from John McBoyle, a reporter and part owner of KSWS Radio in Roswell. And he told me he had something hot for the network. I got into it enough to know that it was a pretty big, pretty big story. When, if you wanted an interruption on this teletype, if you wanted the operator to stop, or you needed, you know, to feed something in, there was a signal bell that you turned on, and this bell came on, and the typing came across. This is the FBI. You will immediately cease transmitting. Brazel was kept incommunicado at the Roswell Army Air Force Base for about a week. Mac was very secretive, and I know that he made it plain that um, he was not supposed to tell this and not supposed to tell that. And I think most of what he was not supposed to tell was that there was any excitement about this material. Mm -hmm. Now, that's my recollection. But Mac was pretty unhappy? Oh, you bet. He was a man who uh, had integrity. Um, he was, he definitely felt insulted and, and misused and disrespected. On Tuesday, July 8th, Base Public Information Officer Walter Hout received a call from Colonel Blanchard. Got the telephone call from Colonel Blanchard, and in essence, he told me that. Uh, we had in, he had in his possession a flying saucer or parts thereof. Gave me a little bit of idea of where it came from and <clears throat> ranch north, west of Roswell. Then stated that uh, Major Marcel, Jesse Marcel, who's our base intelligence officer, was going to fly it to Fort Worth to turn it over to. General Roger Ramey, who was commander, commanding general of the 8th Air Force at that time in Fort Worth. And what did Colonel Blanchard want you to do? <clears throat> he told me to prepare a release uh, with basically the information that he gave me over the phone when it was done to take it into community and deliver it, hand deliver it to the four uh, news media we had in Roswell at that time is what I did. Colonel Blanchard, on orders from the headquarters of the 8th Air Force in Fort Worth, 
had the material loaded on planes and flown out of Roswell. The call came in one day from the range to have B-29 ready to go as soon as possible. And of course someone asked uh, where to. I said, just get a crew on board and uh, have the airplane stand by and we're going to go to Fort Worth. And that was, that was Colonel Blanchard's directive. At any rate, I was in that operations office and Colonel Blanchard drove up and came in and asked, is the aircraft ready? And I and one of the fellow there, who was now dead, uh, said, yes, it's sitting right out front, ready to go. And with this, he turned, stepped out and back into the hallway and waved to some people outdoors and still sitting in the automobiles. And uh, I suspect, trying to recall now, there were four or five or six people. And I'll say, I'll say five. It doesn't really matter. But uh, they came in the front door, straight down the hallway, and right out onto the ramp climb into the airplane. And these were the people that were carrying parts of the crashed uh, flying saucer at that time, a UFO today, that uh, I got to see. And that was the only thing I got to see. And it was very short, very quick. Uh, Colonel Blanchard, in order to get out of their way, had backed into the doorway of the uh, ops office. And I stepped up to him and I said, Colonel, turn sideways. I want to see too. <laughs> Maybe if I hadn't said that to him, made it obvious that I was there, uh, I would not have been shipped out two weeks later. <laughs> so he just turned and looked at me, and he did turn sideways so that I could half step into the doorway and watch the fellows go through. And what I, thus I saw them carrying certain pieces of these metal items and uh, as I've described to other people when asked they uh, they had one piece that was oh I like to say uh, 18 to 24 inch or coffee tabletop size brushed stainless steel in color. Maybe if you think of the uh, common aluminum foil roll today, when you pull it out, uh, one side's real reflective, but that's not what it was. It was the like the opposite side, which is rather dull. Doesn't have great reflective power. And I've heard it mentioned now, of course, so many times about the uh, I-beam with the markings on it and so forth. And I actually saw that piece of I-beam being carried through and, and uh, saw the markings. But it was a case of here it was and there it went. And uh, very quick. That was all I got to see. Well, they, we flew the, these pieces. They told us it was a parts of the flying saucer. And we flew from Roswell to Fort Worth. And it, we started out, they told us we'd be going to Wright Patterson in Ohio. Uh -huh. And we got to Fort Worth, and they transferred them to B-25 and took them on to Wright Patterson. And uh, what did and you do then? Then we returned to Roswell. Okay. Who, who do you recall was on board that B-29 when you left Roswell? Uh, Colonel Jennings was on board, and, and Colonel Barron's law, Major uh, Wonderlick and uh, uh, Major Marcel was the ones up front. Okay. And and who was it who told you that these these were pieces of a flying saucer? I don't remember this, uh, who it was, but uh, it must have been Captain Henderson. Uh, what did you think when you heard that? Well, I was uh, at first I'd heard. Uh, Bunch of flying saucers. So it didn't really mean a whole no, lot. I didn't. Didn't. What uh, what was it that was actually loaded on board that you saw? Well, we had uh, it just packages and uh, wrapping paper, uh -huh. and one of them was triangle shaped, about two and a half feet uh, across, 
bottom. And the rest were in smaller packages, uh, about the shoebox size. The triangle shape, is that an unusual kind of package? It seemed to be. Yeah. And, uh, and this was uh, brown paper on the outside? Right, with tape. Uh -huh. And do you have, did you actually load this stuff? Yes, right. What, what was your feeling when you... Well, picked just like I picked up an empty package. Is that right? right. Very light. Right. Uh, my involvement was to help load the crates of the debris onto the aircraft. Why don't you back up a little bit from there? Were you aware of something happening? Yes. Uh, we all became aware of it. Uh, with our people going to the hangar, that was on the uh, east side of the ramp. We were on the far west side of the ramp. Our people were going over there, and uh, they'd come back and remeasure the aircraft to the inside for the capacity. Go back over there, and they were crating this stuff up. And when the uh, you say they were creating the stuff up, did you see what they were creating up? All, all I saw was what they showed uh, on TV here uh, during your first program that I called in. It was a little piece of material, uh, so big square, and you could crumple it up, let it out, and it would come out flat. And you could not crease it. One of the guys that was uh, in on the crating and so forth had picked up a piece, slipped it in his pocket. And where he is now, I don't know. Now, when I spoke with you on the phone, I mentioned about a distant cousin of mine that was uh, with the Secret Service. Mm -hmm. And uh, during our conversation, this was back in the uh, 70s. I don't think of the year, but well, it was in the early 70s, family reunion, and we talked at length. And uh, I asked him, I said, where, where would they take something like that? I said, he said, well, he says, most likely Los Alamos. All of our secret stuff was in Los Alamos. He didn't have any first-hand knowledge of this event, though. He was there. At Roswell? Yes. He came as uh, uh, more or less a representative of President Truman. Did you see him at Los Alamos? I mean, at, at Roswell? He saw me. But he didn't speak to you then? No. He recognized my features to uh, the features of the family. Uh, his daddy and my daddy were very close in relationship. I mean, uh, they palled around all the time. But uh, in the 70s, about 72, I think it was, when we were talking. He said he recognized me there, but he didn't want to identify himself. With what department or agency was he with in 1947? He was uh, still with the Secret Service. I don't know what particular, particular branch. Did you discuss the specifics about what went on at Roswell with him in 72? Well, uh, some things. In other words, uh, he asked uh, what outfit I was with, and I told him, I said, the first ATU. He said, oh, you guys flew it out. And I said, flew it. And he says, yeah, plane. And I said, well, they said it. I said, uh, we got the backyard gossip of the UFO or something of that sort. He kind of grinned, he says, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was it was uh, uh, July 9th, uh, 1947, and we left Roswell uh, with a crate, and uh, we, we flew it to Fort Worth, uh, Coswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth. What were you told was in the crate? Actually, when we left, we were, we didn't know. Uh, no, we didn't know that in the crate that there was probably. Uh, you know, something classified really till we got back and the, and the kind of the rumors started talking around and, and you know, and uh, we did get a little flack as far as, as uh, that we, we had taken something probably and they were joking, joking about it to us, you know, but. Any talk on the flight, during the flight? 
No, no, there was, there was no no talk of, of, uh, of anything. I, I, I don't. I didn't really realize what it was on the way down there until mm -hmm. on, on the way back uh, we realized it was something classified, and, you know, and, and uh, uh, that they, they didn't want us to talk about. So you boarded the plane after it loaded crates? No, no, we taxied out. Okay. No, we, we, we boarded the plane in the 393rd area, mm -hmm. see, right, uh, right off of the operations, really. And, uh, uh, taxi down to the to the uh, to the uh, area where we picked up the, the crate and uh, uh, loaded the crate there. Now, like I say, I I don't remember loading that crate. I don't know whether it was on the the blister back there or what, but uh, but uh, I, I do remember uh, at Fort Worth unloading the thing, and and, uh, and they were MPs on there. I remember the MPs. Now you say MPs on there. You know, on the flight. Mm -hmm. Were they armed? Yes. Had the old standard 45, you know. It was a low-level flight. It was in the summertime, and uh, the weather, of course, you know, in the heat. When it was, it was, uh, yeah, yeah, see, so so it was kind of funny that we didn't get the altitude, but uh, uh, we, we never got the altitude. I don't, me being in the back, I don't think we ever got over three or 4,000 feet. So it was a, a, a low-level uh, flight, which was unusual. Mm -hmm. Always went hot to uh, what twenty-five thousand and pressurized, you know. Mm -hmm. But that that was not a high high uh, altitude flight. Any one any one member of your crew make any comments after you return back to Roswell, as far as considering the rumors at that time? Did anyone say anything more definite? Well, that you're doing uh, one of the gunners said that uh, Lieutenant Martusi had had said that we we had made history. Uh, I didn't hear it because I wasn't in the front, but but uh, one of the, the gunners said that that's what they had said in the front. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's about all. And I and I do remember when we landed in Fort Worth that one of the persons that we met, uh, say six or seven, whatever was there, was a was a classmate of, of Lieutenant Mar of Martusi's. Um, I, I do remember that remark because they hugged each other and, you know, and, and hadn't seen each other in a while, so uh, I remember that that part of it. And, uh, was there anything special about this classmate of Martusi's? Was what now? Was there anything special about this classmate of Martusi's? Well, I, I didn't know it at the time, but somebody said he was an undertaker. What do you think was in the crate? I, I don't know, really know. Of course, the rumors was that they had uh, uh, debris and, uh, from, the, from the crash, and, and uh, I, I'd buy that, you know. Uh, whether there was any bodies, I don't know. I, I don't have any idea, you know, because, uh, like I say, it was sealed. And we flew it there and, and uh, uh, come back, so. The daughter of Melvin Brown says her father told her in 1969 that while stationed at Roswell, he was ordered to guard a truck covered by a tarpaulin. You always started off by saying um, he had to stand guard duty once outside a hangar where a crash source was installed. His commanding officer came up and said, come on, Brown, let's have a look inside. So they both went inside, but they didn't see anything because it was all packed up and ready to be flown to Texas the next morning. And then he would always say, and then, another time, all available men were grabbed. That's his actual words in front of me, that I can remember. All available men were grabbed. They all had to go out to the desert where uh, a crash source would come down. And um, they all had to stand, uh, stand guard duty around this site. They were told to look, but not look, not to take anything in. And even this guy next to them couldn't understand why they had these trucks with some sort of ice or something in them. They, whatever they had in there, they wanted to keep cold. And they couldn't understand what was going on. They, they were confused. Him and this other guy had to sit on the back of this truck, sit guard duty. They both had guns. And um, there was something inside, and they were told not to look. They could get into a lot of trouble if they looked. So, <laughs> so I have to smile every time I say that bit, because he, if somebody tells you to do that, you get a chance you're going to look, aren't you? And uh, him and this other guy did look, and they lifted up the covers. And he, he did say that these trucks were covering. I don't know what he meant by that. It must have been some sort of truck with a, a cover. He lifted up, um, him and this other guy both lifted up the cover and saw 
I say two bodies, but my sister remembers in the same three. We, we disagree on that. Um, they saw these bodies, and uh, they were about four foot tall, no more than that, maybe even less. Uh, much larger heads than we have, slanted eyes, yellowish skin, and not so much when we were big, but when we were younger. We used to giggle like crazy at that bit. We used to, you know, my sister and I used to really giggle and say, weren't you scared, Jessica? Weren't you scared? And he'd say, hell no. He said, no, they look nice. They said, he said, if, they, if they'd been alive, he reckon they would have been nice. They had nice faces. And uh, I don't know whether he said that to reassure us or not. <laughs> He never drew your picture. <clears throat> no. He, although he got that bit, the subject was changed. Then he'd say, whatever you do, don't tell anyone, you get daddy into a lot of trouble. It was always when he got to the body that he changed it. Yeah, that was it. Changed. And if you pestered him, he got angry. He got most angry about it. But he did, I must say, I think he enjoyed telling the story when he was actually telling it. It was almost as if, um, and I think my sister's agreeing with me here, um, it's almost as if when he actually told the story, he wished he had At Fort Worth, Brigadier General Roger Ramey and his Chief of Staff, Colonel Thomas DuBose, displayed what they said was the material recovered on the Brazel Ranch for news photographers. Ramey said the material was a weather balloon radar target. It was definitely not a weather balloon. And uh, it was an aircraft. So what it could have been, I wouldn't know. I still don't know. There's no doubt in your mind, I gather, that the balloon story was a cover story. Absolutely none. We knew that it was a cover story, and, and if, whose idea it was, I, I have the faintest, faintest idea, but we used that in order to uh, assuage the curiosity of the press, because this had gotten out and Fort Worth Star Telegram, Dallas News, and the UPI. And well, the three press four. release from Roswell, Blanchard's press release. Yeah, well, yeah, there are all these pictures from Roswell. You see, all this created a lot of hubbub, and and Eighth Air Force headquarters had to be the hub, the guy that they're going to going to ask the president. Somebody along the line is going to say. Who's running this show that comes up to the 8th Air Force? Ramey and, and or the chief of staff, somebody in there has got to know something about it. Bill Brazel says today his father knew the debris was not from a weather balloon. He said that's what the Air Force tried to make him believe, that it was a weather balloon. He said, Bill, he said it was not a weather balloon. He said, I don't know what it was. But he said it was something altogether different and much bigger. Brazel adds that he picked up some of the debris that the military left behind. And I was talking about it. I went into Corona and I was sitting there in the beer joint and I got to these, of course, my friends was asking me if I'd found any more or anything like this. And I said, well, I picked up a few scraps, uh, about a cigar box full. And uh, somebody, I don't know, must have informed the Air Force because first thing I know, I have visitors. And they say they'd like to have this material. And they didn't tell me they'd confiscate it. They just said, well, like we're going to have it one way or the other, you know. During this period, Glenn Dennis, a mortician working for the Ballard Funeral Home in Roswell, which had a contract to provide mortuary services for the base, received several phone calls from the base mortuary officer. I got a call about around 1.15 or somewhere right after lunch, around 1.15 or 1.30, from the mortuary officer wanting to know uh, what size, what was the smallest size hermetically sealed casket that we had in stock or that we could get. And I think I informed him that we usually kept a four foot, but I could possibly get a three six. And, uh, and I said, I mean, what do you have? What do you have in mind? He said, well, this would be for future services later on in case we said, he said, we, we need to know this in case something comes up in the future. And then about another hour, maybe 45 minutes later, I get a call from the same officer. 
and he said, I would like to know uh, what your preparations for bodies that might have been laying out in the elements are. Uh, he said, could you give me what your preparation and how, what, how you would do it? And, I, and then before I could explain our procedure, before I could explain it, he said, what, what we're interested in, and this would probably be for future use too, he said, uh, would your procedure, what you would have to do to the bodies that have been exposed to the elements and everything, would, what would your procedure do to changing the, uh, like the chemical compounds, the tissues, the uh, blood and all that, what would that do uh, would that destroy any of it? Then let's say another, probably another hour, hour, 15 minutes. Uh, I get a call, we have, we had the only ambulance service. And I got a call on an emergency. There was an airman that was injured in a minor accident. He had a laceration on the board and in the nose. I think he had a fractured nose. <clears throat> and I took him to the base. But I didn't put him on a stretcher. He just set up in the front seat with me. I gave him first aid and then we just drove out to the hospital infirmary. <clears throat> and where I usually park the ambulance, there was three field ambulances, old army ambulances there. And two of them, there was a, there was an MP standing right there at the back of the of those field ambulances. And I really never thought too much about it because usually there's an ambulance, you know, something back there most of the time anyway. But when I was taking the airman in, we walked up on the ramp like, I noticed the back doors of <coughs> the two ambulances that the old field ambulances were open, and uh, uh, I saw it look like a wreckage, some type of, you know, they might have had a plane crash or something, and I saw some wreckage in there. <clears throat> but what I saw looked kind of like the bottom of a canoe. It was kind of in a shape, but it looked, you know, it, it reminded me, but it wasn't, let's say, over two feet between two, and maybe possibly the most of piece it wouldn't be over three feet at, at most. What did it appear to be made of? Well, <clears throat> what it looked like to me, it looked like if you, I don't know if you've ever, if you take stainless steel and like put a torch to it, it you can see how the blue, you'll get a blue or purplish uh, tinge off it, you know, and it kind of looked like that. Uh, uh, an even color? Well, not particularly, it was kind of modeled, you know, modeled. There exhibit gradations in color. Or was it uh, a different the color? Thing, one part of the well, it was uh, the, the purple only, stain was it lighter or darker? Or, well, yeah, it looked like you know it might have been in a hot flame. Some of it might have looked more like stainless steel, but most of it was kind of bluish purplish tinge that I saw. But the only difference is on this outer edge on the curve there that that it looked like that. There might have been some inscription, something that, which I kind of thought reminded me of some Egyptian symbols or something like that. But just, I mean, it was, you know, I was walking past and I really never thought about this mm -hmm. until I got back to the funeral. Then what, what happened after you saw that? <clears throat> well, then I took the airman on in and <clears throat> checked him into the infirmary there and turned him over to the whoever was on call, the nurse there. And, and I have to always, when I bring them in, I'd sign a report, you know, about funeral and ambulance out of transportation and because I'd always have to file a statement later and send back out. One particular nurse that, uh, that I was pretty well acquainted with, and I was going to want to see if she was there and, and buy her a Coke, and we usually talked a lot, but uh, this nurse had only been there. She'd only been commissioned like around three months and she graduated from college and taken the state boards and got her license and then she went into the service and uh, was a second lieutenant. Anyway, as I started back to see her before I got to the, before I got back to the lounge, there was some uh, examining rooms on each side of the hall <clears throat> and she came out of one of the examining rooms and coming across the hallway. And I noticed she had a, I don't know, it was a handkerchief with a piece of gauze water over her mouth. And then 
she saw me and she said, uh, what are you doing here and how did you get in here? She said, my gosh, get out of here as soon as possible. She said, you're going to get in a lot of trouble. And I said, what the devil's going on? And she said, just get out of here. And then she disappeared and that was it. And about that time, it was when I got there right beside the door that she went in, there was a captain standing there. And he said, here you are. And I told him I was Glenn Denison home that I brought a patient out and he said you wait here just a minute <clears throat> and he waved at someone and then about that time two MPs showed up and uh, where I got in trouble was I said to him I said looks like you had a crash and I said I need to go back and get preparations ready because we usually in the crash we always did our identification and everything in our garage and everything getting the dog tags and the buddies and everything else. So I said, should I go get ready? And he said, that's when he said, you wait right here. And then two MPs come on and said, come on, mister, you, you're leaving. And then, what do you remember about him? Well, I don't remember anything about him, but the two MPs was taking me down the hall. They were, they were you know, on each side of me. And they told me they had orders to follow me back to the funeral home. But, uh, we had gotten just uh, not probably over 10, 15 feet, and then we heard this voice said, <clears throat> we're not through with that SOB. He said, bring him back. So I turned around, went back, and then there was this southern captain, red-headed captain. Uh, he, was, he was a mean-looking number, you know, but he was talking pretty rough. And, uh, he said, you did not see anything. There was no crash here. You don't go into town and making any rumors that you saw anything that there was any crashes. And he said, you could get in a lot of trouble. Well, I was a little agitated, a little mad about the situation when he called me an SOB to start with. And I said, hey, look, mister, I said, I'm a civilian and you can't do a damn thing to me. And he said, oh, yes, we can, mister. He said, somebody would be picking your bones out of the sand. He said, we can do anything to you, you know, that we want to. And then there was a sergeant, a colored sergeant, that had a pad or something in his hand, I remember that. And he said, he'll make real good dog food. He said, he would make good dog food for our dogs. And he said, get the SOB out. And that's when they, then that's when I went on out and went back to the funeral. Then the next day, I tried to call this nurse. I wanted to call her see what was going on, because then, you know, when someone escorts you back, which had never happened before, you knew there was something wrong. It wasn't normal procedure, you knew that. So I tried to get a hold of her, and uh, they kept telling me that she wasn't there yet. She wasn't there, and so I, I called maybe three or four times that morning, and around about 11 o'clock, she called the funeral home and said, I understand you've been trying to get a hold of me, and she said, I'm not on duty today. But she said, I need to talk to you. And uh, I said, fine, you want me to come to base? She said, well, let's just meet at the officer's club. And she was very upset. And she looked like, you know, death more than over. But uh, she said, you won't leave. What happened? And she said, before I talk to you, before I tell you anything, <coughs> excuse me, I'm having a throat problem here, but she said, uh, you have to give me a sacred oath. She will not ever mention my name or not. She said, you can get me in a lot of trouble. So she said, but I'm going to tell you, you don't know where you got this, you know. And uh, I said, what do you mean by sacred oath? And she said, I mean like cutting your arm off. That's what she told me. You know? <laughs> and I said, okay, because I said, I would definitely like to know what, you know, what's going on. And do you think she was telling you this because you were good friends? Well, I think so, and I think she didn't want to get in trouble either, because she, I mean, she was very conscientious of everything. I mean, if, if the rules and regulations, I mean, that was just like reading her Bible to her, you know, you followed the rules and regulations. Yet, she told you. She, she didn't that, have to say anything. Yeah, and that probably was against the rules, wasn't it, telling you? Well, I'm sure. I imagine I would assume, and she wouldn't have told me that unless someone you know, said you keep this to yourself or whatever. I'm assuming this now <clears throat> because uh, 
But anyway, she said, uh, what, what happened, and the way she got involved in the first place, she was going across the room to this other uh, room to pick up some supplies. This is where the two doctors that were in there supposedly doing a preliminary autopsy on these bodies. And she got whatever she went. She started out, and the doctor said, "You're not going anywhere, nurse. We have to have you in here. So we got to, we have to have some help." And she said she never smelled anything so horrible in her life when she got in there. And uh, I said it was it was the most gruesome, most horrible sight that she had ever seen in her life. The smell was it was almost devastating. She said I was never so horrified. In my life, and she said, "I don't know if I'll ever sleep again or anything else." She said, "I've never seen anything so gruesome." I said, "Well, look, you're a nurse, and I said, anytime you're in this business, you're going to see a lot of things." And I said, "You may as well get used to it." And she said, "No, this is what it is." She said, "This is something that that no one's ever seen." Was she ordinarily calm or emotional? Oh no, she was so hysterical. She was great. Well, I mean, ordinarily. Yeah. Oh yeah, she was great. Not laid back, but uh, very precise, though, that, you know, that, I mean, she would grab her head and shake her head and cover her eyes and everything else. <clears throat> and, uh, what were you thinking at this point? Well, I didn't know, because I, I mean, I was thinking that she was going in total shock. I really thought, hey, this, there's a problem here, and I thought she would probably go into total shock, is what I was really thinking. And while she was telling this, all the people were there in the... There wasn't anyone around us because we kind of had a table up on the side of the office above ourselves. And she was hoping that no one could hear us. In fact, there was some up maybe at the counter there at the bar there. We were in the lounge and, and uh, we had ordered a sandwich. And, uh, but she was never, never touched her sandwich. I don't think I ever did either. I'm not sure. But she looked like she was going in this total shop. I said, my God, you know, and she said, I have a, she said, last night I made a diagram. She said, you won't believe this, but she said, I made a diagram. And she said, on <clears throat> these little bodies. And she gave me a, uh, she drew me a diagram of a, of an arm. Because she said the anatomy from, from the shoulder to here was real short and this arm was longer here. And there was only four fingers on, on there wasn't a thumb, only four fingers little long, uh, very uh, gradual little hands. And she said when one of the hands was detached from the arm, and she said when they, the doctors turned it over, that she noticed on and they did, they made a notation. That's what she was doing, was trying to take notes and making notations for them. And they were all sick. But she said that on the tips of these little fingers, it looked like little pads with little little holes that kind of looked like a small suction cup on each end of these fingers here. It said there was no thumb at all on that, they only had like the four fingers on that. And she said the head, the heads were <clears throat> very much larger than, than, than the body. It was out of proportion for the size of the body, the head. The eyes were very deeply uh, set back and set in. And she said that the amazing thing about the skulls that that uh, it wasn't like ours, that it was kind of like a newborn baby. They were kind of flexible that, you know, the doctors couldn't move, that it wasn't, a, you know, like a hard skull. And she said that was a different, uh, the nose was very concave. She said it was only like a couple of little orifices and, the, and the, you didn't have the bridge of the nose, but it was more or less concave. Uh, the mouth was just a real, fine little slit there. The doctor said there, there was no teeth, but it looked like maybe a heavy cartilage or something like that. It was very kind of hard, then, but uh, not like, you know, was the teeth or anything. The ears, they had, the ears didn't have any, there wasn't an ear like ours, but there was a couple of little orifices in the ears up here on each side. Very small, but it looked like there was a couple of little, like little flaps, she explained it. And she drew me a diagram of the head. She drew me a diagram of the arms and, and the hands. And it was on the back of a prescription pad where, you know, the nurses always carried a prescription pad, you know, and I'll take the notes and everything for the doctors and all that. 
these were really small, but she had drawn those the night before. And she and she gave them to me. She said, you know, you can have these, but there again, I was sworn to secrecy again that, you know, either destroy them after I got through with them or whatever. Anything about these being the necks? She didn't say anything about the necks. She didn't say anything about the clothing. She said that they definitely had no hair at all. But then about that time, she said they all became so very ill. And when I saw her coming out, is when she was. That's when she was. She was so sick. She thought she was going to vomit. You know, what she, were they ill from? Well, from mainly from the odor, I think. It was. She said it was the most god awful smell that she ever smelled in her life. Was being in the funeral bed, so I smelled the floaters and everything else. I mean, I've been through that experience. I know what she was talking about. Now, right. how many bodies were there? She said there was three bodies. Two of them were very mangled. She said it looked like some predatory or something that might have <coughs> been destroying portions of the body because the the tissue and some of it were cut in strings like, you know, they were pulled. Uh, the doctor thought maybe this is what happened with that. But some of them, like she said, the hands and the arms were all dismembered from, because uh, that could have happened from the removal. You don't know what happened. One, she said, was some really pretty much all there, and this was the one that they were describing, you know. She said the body was uh, well intact, that one was. Did you she see? said they were like between three and a half to four feet tall, so that would give you, and, but the bodies were black. Of course, you know, being mm -hmm. exposed to the element could have caused that. Yeah. How did she refer to them? What did she call them? She didn't know what to call them. She just said small bodies up. Best of my knowledge, now she, I don't think she ever called them anything except very small bodies. Did any, any I, she express any idea of, of what their origin was? The doctor said it, that the, the two doctors, and she didn't know whether they were pathologists or what, but she'd never seen them before either. And so she assumed they might be pathologists, but she wasn't sure. No, I mean the, the bodies. But she said oh, the, yeah. the doctors, what again, she said the doctor said, hey, this isn't anything we've ever seen before in our life, and there's no textbook that's ever covered this, mm -hmm. you know. Is there any indication of the sex of these beings? She said, I asked her about that, and she said, I don't know. She said, I don't even, she said, I didn't look, and I don't think anybody else did either. She said that two of the bodies were probably so mangled and that they probably couldn't have told it, you know, but she said, I don't know about the other. Did she say anything about legs, feet? She didn't. She just what she diagrammed and what she told me about the head and the arms and the hands is really old. And she really. And then she got real ill again while we were sitting there. And she said, uh, she said I've got to get back to the barracks. She said I just can't. She said I don't think I can make it another step. So anyway, I drove her. We went to the nurse club and I drove her back to the barracks there to the nurses' quarters. And that was the last time I ever saw her. Sorry then. The widow of decorated World War II pilot, Oliver Wendell Pappy Henderson, says he also told her about seeing the bodies of aliens at the base. And during this time were those crashes of the UFOs in the desert or out of town of Roswell. And uh, he never said a thing about them because uh, he, he had a top secret clearance had anything having to do with dropping atomic bombs, you had to have the, the highest uh, clearance. So he uh, it witnessed this crash and the little people who were there, I don't know just where he saw them. So I never did pin him down. I, I don't know why I didn't. It was so shocking to me that something like this was real that uh, I never did. How did he happen to tell you that he'd been involved with seeing the little bodies of the, the crash flying saucer? We were at the grocery store and uh, we were going to check out our groceries and uh, there were newspapers at the stands, as there always are, and here were these news was this newspaper and he said, well, I guess now that uh, they're putting in the paper, I can tell you about this. I wanted to tell you for years. He said, I want you to read this article because it's a true story. And I not only know that it's true, but I'm the pilot who flew the wreckage of the UFO to 
Dayton, Ohio. You mentioned that earlier that he had seen the bodies, and one of them was damaged in some way. I think he told me that they uh, were small, they had large heads for their size, and that the uh, material that their suits were made of was different to anything, you know, it was a strange kind of material. What I remember him telling me was that they were small people. Um, I don't remember three feet high, but cer certainly shorter than we were, small people, uh, pale, um, slightly slanted eyes, large, you know, sort of larger heads, and um, humanoid looking, human-esque looking, but not like us, different from us. And uh, he said they were dead, and that um, he had seen them, and that he had flown the wreckage of his flying saucer. Anderson's friend, John Kromtroder, says Pappy apparently kept a piece of the debris. Yeah. Produce this uh, piece of metal for me to look at. He said, what do, what do I think of it? He said, well, it's, it's different. And I felt it, and it did feel different. And I studied it some. I was able to determine that its uh, metal structure was uh, different than alloys like we have in our aircraft, for instance. And of course, he did uh, uh, preface his uh, question by stating this was from this uh, craft. Apparently, uh, I think it was a case of uh, appropriation that he acquired this, you know, for future study, perhaps. At about the same time, another unidentified object apparently crashed about 175 miles to the west of Corona on the plains of San Augustine. The wreckage was discovered by Grady L. Barney Barnett, a civil engineer with the U.S. Soil Conservation Service. Mr. Barnett told me that he'd, and when he was on a, coming back from one of his field trips, he'd run onto a flying saucer that had burst open and there were four beings on the ground and that he was surveying the site at about the time this uh, archaeological group from the University of Pennsylvania coming to see. There were about four or five people with this group. As they were just starting to look things over fairly closely, the military moved in and gave them a briefing to not, not say anything about it and to keep quiet that it was in the national interest to get out of there. What, uh, what was his feeling about what it was that he had experienced. He had no uh, no qualms about what it was. He said the vehicle from outer space wasn't any question. The beings on there were nothing like, not exactly like human beings. How did Similar, you, but not exactly. How did he describe them? He described them being about three and a half to four feet tall, very slim in stature, and with a, their heads were hairless, with no eyebrows, no eyelashes, no hair, and sort of a, a pear-shaped head with the top of the head being smaller, or larger. Mm -hmm. Any other characteristics about their appearance? Only one thing that he mentioned is the hands were, were uh, not covered, and they had four fingers. Well, I remember that he saw, uh, one time we went to visit, and I don't remember it was before my husband and I married, or after, I don't recall the date, but he said that he saw a UFO uh, fall. Mm -hmm. He was out working in the field, and I understood that he was out in the St. Augustine uh, plane, mm -hmm. and he went over to where it was, and uh, where it fell, mm -hmm. and uh, he uh, got nearly to the side, and there was a group of um, people on a Ge geological mm -hmm. or uh, archaeological mm -hmm. uh, hunt, and uh, they were over there. I, I, I don't remember how many people he said, but they got nearly up to this UFO, but it was close enough to see some creatures, or he said they didn't look like human beings mm -hmm. out there. And uh, along came a government or some trucks. No, with government, you mean? I guess it was government. 
you know, as I say, it's been a long time ago. Mm -hmm. If someone came along and I understood it, I don't know if it was army or what, I think he just termed it government trucks and they told them to go on back and forget they ever saw anything. Now that's all I recall. Mm -hmm. Probably in the, in the fall of 1966, uh, after we moved here, my wife and I to Park Street, uh, I met Ruth and Barney Barnett. They were living at 708 Park Street at that time, and we moved in across the street at 715 Park Street. And they were retired, and they were, you know, always hanging around their house and stuff. And I got to know Barney and, and Ruth pretty well. And, uh, oh, one morning about 3.30 in the morning when I got ready to go to work, and I used to work at White Sands, uh, my phone rang and it was Ruth and she wanted to know if I could come over and help her pick Barney up. He had fallen about one in the morning when he got up to go to the bathroom. Well, this had happened before because Barney had been ill and he'd had some surgeries and he was a little weak. So I came over about 3.30 and I picked Barney up and I put him to bed and I went on to work. When I got in from work that same day, it was probably around 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon and it was a sunny day. And when I got home, I noticed that Barney was sitting right outside his front door and just, you know, in his pajamas and stuff, in a chair with a blanket over his lap, getting some sunshine. So I decided to come over and visit with him. And when I came over, we started visiting about what a nice day it had been. And I was too bad he'd had a rough night and so on, you know, and that he, you know, had these surgeries. And we got to talking about what might have caused his surgery. And he told me that the doctors had told him that it was probably caused, uh, the cancer that he had in his throat and mouth was probably caused because he smoked cigars when he was a younger man. But Barney told me that he didn't agree with him. He told me, he said, I think I got this cancer, he said, from breathing some radiation in, he said, from a UF, not a UFO, is what he told me, from a flying saucer that crashed on the plains of St. Augustine. And when he said that, I said, where? And he said, on the plain of St. Augustine's west of Magdalena, he said, I saw a, a flying saucer crashed out there, he said, and I saw the bodies and everything, and they were little bodies, and I, and, and I saw them, and I think that's where I got this radiation. So I asked him how close did he get, and Barney told me, he kind of leaned over where he was sitting on his chair, and he said, I was this close. He said, I leaned and stooped right over him, and I saw him. And I think that at that time, he said, I inhaled that radiation through my mouth, and that's where I think I got this, uh, you know, mouth cancer and throat cancer and so on. And, uh, but he did tell me on the plains of St. Augustine, west of Magdalena. And I asked him if anyone else had seen this, and he said, yes, that there were other people out there at that time, you know. And uh, I never questioned him too much about it, because at first I kind of felt sorry for him. I thought he was kind of, you know, losing his mind a little bit or something, imagining this. But as it turned out, I guess he wasn't, you know, because Barney was, you know, all there mentally till the day he died, you know. He was a very intelligent man. So did you believe Barney? I, I certainly do believe Barney. I, I, he would never fabricate something like that up, you know. Another account of the event comes from Robert Drake, who was an archaeology student doing research on the plains in September 1947. On Sunday, 28th September 1947, we started back to the University of New Mexico, stopping at a ranch where we were expected for the midday meal. About 200 feet from the ranch house, while waiting to eat, I walked over to a fence on which a large bone had been wired next to a post. While there, I was joined by a ranch hand who talked about Indian artifacts being found in the vicinity and about how the summer rains made it extremely muddy there, and so forth. Then he told me that a spaceship had crashed a short distance to the south several months before. He seemed quite serious about it, and said that there had been dead bodies with it. I do not think that I responded much more than to say that when I had been at the Czech Chaco Canyon University of New Mexico Field School in early July of that year, people were talking about spaceship crashes in New Mexico as well. In late December 1952, while living in Hermosillo with my family, we were visited by several former fellow students at the University of New Mexico. Among them was Roscoe Wilmoth. I had been in an anthropology course with him in 1951. While showing him around the building, he told me that he regretted not coming 
to Hermosillo via the plains of St. Augustine, as he had wanted to see the area where, he said, there had been a crashed spaceship with bodies. I believe that I said little or nothing in response to his statement at that time. In January 1990, an apparent first-hand witness to the Plains event came forward to relate his own experience there at the age of five. Well, we had just moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico on July 4th, 1947. This was uh, approximately the, the, was the day before we went out on the plane to San Augustine with uh, my Uncle Ted, my cousin Victor, my father, my brother Glenn, and myself. We drove down to the Plains of San Augustine, which is west of Socorro, New Mexico, in the Magdalena Daddle area. And we were down there looking for Bandit and Moss Agate, which, uh, according to my Uncle Ted and uh, my cousin Victor, was prevalent in the area. And my brother, being a, an amateur rock hound, wanted to get some of this. And it was a way of showing us around the area. And they had relatives down in uh, Magdalena that they wanted to introduce us to. And so we had gone down there and uh, we got down in the Horse Springs area and had uh, driven off onto the plains down an old uh, rutted road uh, for oh, a mile or so and uh, seemed like a long ways. We parked the car, got out of the car and walked down a hillside, a, a, a semi forested, I guess you could say it had pinyon trees and scrub oak and stuff like that on it and we'd walked to well, not scrub oak, but the cedar, and walk down the hillside into a, an arroyo, a dry wash, and then walk south down a dry wash uh, toward where the agates were supposed to be at. And as we came around a, a bend in the arroyo that had uh, pinon and uh, cedar trees growing on it, we were able to see farther ahead down the arroyo, and on the next ridge line, there was a large silver disc-shaped object was embedded in the side of the ridge line, and uh, there was debris and, and, and wreckage and stuff uh, strewn about the area, but mainly this thing was intact. Um, I would estimate its size from an adult perspective to be something like 35 feet in diameter. I've heard other, other people who were there say they thought it was like 50 feet, but as an adult, I would say about 35 feet in diameter, quite large. When we got up to it, there were uh, four bodies there, not human. Uh, there was two of them who were obviously dead. One of them was obviously very badly injured, and one of them apparently uh, suffered no ill effects, or it didn't appear to be injured, and was uh, was ambulatory, was mobile. I was just sitting there next to the one that was still alive that appeared to be Were they right next to the vehicle? Right next to it, right under the edge of it. And uh, this craft had apparently come in from the east, bounced off one ridge line, went plowing through this arroyo area, and then crashed into the, the ridge line and embedded itself. And uh, they were sitting back under the edge. It was kind of tilted up like this, and they were sitting back under the edge here. And uh, I'm assuming that this one creature that was all right had laid this material on the ground, but it looked like unrolled uh, tinfoil that these other three creatures were laying on, like it was trying to, like, like you do a person in shock and put them on a blanket kind of a thing. And apparently uh, it had some boxes there around it um, and had apparently been trying to give first aid or help these other creatures uh, when we first got there. And as we approached, um, the creature drew back like this, like it was in fear of us, like we were going to hurt it. And it wasn't very long, you know, in trying to communicate with the adults were. And it, it seemed to calm down and just sat there and kind of looked back and forth, watching them, uh, apparently trying to figure out what was going on. Like what did it look them. like a little bit more? These creatures, all of them were oh, about four foot tall four, four and a half feet tall. They had very large heads that were shaped larger on the top and they kind of tapered down. Not to a real sharp point, but just tapered down to where they were thin. And they had very large, very large oval shaped or almond shaped, I guess you could say, black eyes. That had, they were so shiny, they had almost a bluish tint to them when the 
the light reflected off them. Their skin coloration, uh, I think the best way I can describe that is kind of a bluish tinted milky white. Uh, it was, uh, it, it looked like someone in shock. And the ones that were laying on the ground were really, really looked more that way, more blue. How about ears, nose, mouth? No, there was there was no visible ears on the, the creatures except like if you was just to cover your ear like this, to where there was just a riser and then a hole, without uh, you know your earlobe and, mm -hmm. and the rest of the ear there. How about nose? Um, it was uh, the nose was very very small, almost imperceptible, uh, and just like two holes straight in, and the lips were just a straight line like a cut and I, you couldn't see any visible lips like we have it was just a slit and what hair never color? made a sound pardon what hair color there was, there was no hair they were okay. completely bald and no sounds i never heard a sound of one not out of any of the creatures including did, the one that was did you see fingers uh, yeah they had uh, they had fingers like this they didn't have a little finger they just had the thumb had three extra digits except the center digit was longer and the other two were about the same size. They were very long and slender, looked very delicate. And I've made the statement before, and I'll make it again. I think they would have made an excellent violinist because of the, 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 the structure of their hands. Um, they were wearing one-piece suits. All of them were dressed exactly the same, and it was sort of a, a real shiny, silverish gray color. Um, no zippers, buttons? No, I saw no zippers, no buttons. Insignia? Um, no, no insignias. The only thing that was different, you know, they all had this, but the only thing that was different from the, the silvery the gray thing suit was that down like the seam on the, like it was a seam on the shoulder and around the collar it was trimmed in what appeared to be maroon, like cording. Uh, then the suits were continuous with their footgear. You could see right about this area down, it seemed to be less pliable than it was up here, like this was a stripper area, like they were boots or shoes or something. But they were all dressed exactly the same. Okay, so you and your family are talking back and forth, wondering what was going on. What did your family say? I mean, did well, they say anything? Or? Yeah, my brother, one of the first remarks I heard he made was, uh, that's a goddamn spaceship. Uh, you know, there, there was bodies up there, and you know, I was told not to go up there, which I did. And uh, how old was your brother at the time? He, he was in his early 20s, I think 20, 21, something okay. like that. He was a lot older than you were. Oh, yes, considerably. Uh, we, when we got up there, I kind of meandered off to one side, and this thing was cocked up, and I was standing here. The bodies were here, and everybody else was kind of down here, except my cousin Victor was over here playing and looking in this gaping hole on the side of this this disc, and it, it shaped just like a, a discus, except for a round dome was up on top, and there was this big gaping gash in here where you could see inside, and it looked like a double hall. How big the length? The, the gash. dome? Oh, oh, the gash. Well, it uh, covered the greater majority from the center of the craft out. It was just like a gaping hole in there. And I'm thinking, you know, it's like about 30 feet, 35 feet in diameter, so we're talking about 17 feet maybe. Uh -huh. And most of most of that one side was ripped open like that. And you could see inside, and you could see another double hull like uh, in there. And there was these rows of components that was on there. And there was lights that flashed uh, on and off. Some of them were steady, some were flashing. There was a lot of debris and stuff hanging out of the hole. There was uh, evidence that there had apparently been fire. It looked like it had been burnt along the edge there. Uh, the gash. Now this wasn't a gash that could have been caused by the thing coming into the ground. It wasn't at the leading edge of the vehicle. No, no, this was inside like, it almost appeared, it was elliptical. It almost appeared as if something the same shape as the disc we were looking at had hit that that same, you know, had hit the disc and left an imprint that pretty closely approximated the outside diameter of the disc itself, and uh, it appeared to be caved inward. Okay. And and, and kind of like you hit it like this and just crumpled and caved in and ripped it open. Um, okay, so you're you're there. You you take all this and everybody's mystified. 
What were the circumstances outside? Hot, cold? Very, very hot. Well, to me, being the first time in New Mexico and coming from back east, that, that dry heat was just like being inside of an oven. It was unbelievable to me. And the, that was the odd part about this thing. The closer you got to it, the cooler it was. And standing under it in the shade there, uh, next to these creatures' bodies, it was like uh, refrigerated air conditioning. And did you feel air coming out of this thing? Or? No, it was just like it was ambient. And I remember reaching up and putting my hand on the side of it that I think I was afraid it was going to hit my head because there was enough room for me as a small child, you know. Uh, uh, I was approximately the same size as these creatures to, to walk up under there and stand there, but I, I kind of did like that, put my hand up against this thing. What did it feel like? It was ice cold. It felt like it just came out of a, out of a freezer. Was it smooth? Was it rough? Uh, it was very smooth. It, it had a very smooth texture to it. It was obviously made out of metal. It was very solid. And it was very cold, ice cold. And there was a smell in the area. It smelled uh, volatile, uh, acrid, like uh, acetone. And that seemed to be coming out of that gash, that smell. Uh, but the closer you got to this thing, the, the cooler it was. So I, you know, I kind of remained there, and I guess that while they were over here, my father and uh, my uncle Ted and my brother, and uncle Ted was trying to talk to this thing in Spanish, and of course it didn't understand a word he said. And dad tried to talk to it, and then they tried, you know, sign language, and that didn't work. And uh, I don't know for some reason I just uh, I reached down and touched it. This one that was laying next to me. And uh, when I touched it, I realized, you know, I jumped back. It scared me and startled me because I, I suddenly realized that these weren't dolls. I thought they were plastic dolls. And I, you know, I was still in my mind that these are moving dolls until I touched it. And I realized, you know, this was a dead thing. I'd, I'd been, I'd seen dead relatives before. And I unfortunately had made the mistake one time of touching a relative that was in a casket. And I just knew this is a dead thing and it scared me and I ran around behind my father and my uncle and um, this thing was sitting there on the ground and it kept looking back and forth and it just had its hand like this in its lap and it just kept looking back and forth between uh, the three of them and you know, like it was trying to understand and all of a sudden it just turned and looked right straight at me between my uncle Ted and myself this is when it was just like an explosion of things in my head, things I started, you know, feeling just terrible depression and loneliness and fear and uh, you know, just, you know, awful, awful feelings that just suddenly burst into my mind. And I don't know if that meant that it was communicating with me and I was the only one there it could communicate with because I was a kid. I, I don't know. I turned and, and ran ran across the arroyo and up on the area that it had bounced off of during the crash. And we're just standing or looking down at the scene, you know, and my family and uh, off in the distance I could see cattle grazing, I could see a windmill, and I could see dust trails out on the, the you know, playa, out on the plains out there. And, uh, oh, I was there for a little while, and then I, I came back down, and I guess we were there, you know, Victor was in, when I got back down here, Victor was up in the crack, and Ted yelled at him to get out of there, and Glenn went over and grabbed him by the belt and jerked him off. That's your brother. Yeah, and jerked him off and said, get out of there, you could cause this thing to explode and kill us all, you know, and then, of course, he went prowling around in there. Uh, I was kind of standing off to one side looking, that's why I knew that there was, I could look off these rocks that I was standing on, right into this thing. That's why I knew, you know, about the lights and, and the components and stuff, and then, uh, I don't know, I heard other people talking, and I turned, and there was a group of people coming up the arroyo from out on the plains from the south. They had come up there, and of course they walked up and was talking. And uh, How many? Uh, there was uh, an older man and five younger students. Uh, boys, girls? There was three boys and two girls. And they were all, you know, introducing, talking to uh, my father and my uncle and my brother. What did the older one look like? The, the leader of this group, yep. the man, <coughs> he, was a, he was a very tall man, very big man. He, uh, 
He was wearing a pith helmet when he first came up, one of those kind of explorer helmets. And uh, he was bald, and I know that because he had taken it off and he had done this, you know, a couple times with a handkerchief and put it back on. He was a balding man. And he had a round face. He was very red complected. He was a big man. Um, and he apparently was a doctor because he's, they kept calling him doctor. And as I understand it, it was an archaeological group that was out there on some kind of summer thing. And uh, they, they talked. And he apparently was able to speak several foreign languages. And he tried to talk to this creature several times in different languages, and again, to no avail. How did it happen to be there? Had he seen the thing? Well, they claimed that they saw, they said they saw this thing come down the night before, a flaming, you know, and they thought it was a meteorite. And they had uh, talked about, well, in the morning, you know, we'll, we'll go over there and see this, where this meteor came down, because that's what they thought it was. And when the sun came up the next morning, you know, and they got about their business and got up and somebody looked over and said, you know, they saw all the shiny metal and stuff across the plains there and they realized it wasn't a meteorite, it may have been an airplane and that crashed. So they all decided to go over there and see if there was anybody who was alive, you know, that was hurt that needed help. They had driven on it? No, they walked over, apparently, the way I understand it. Uh, and it's quite a ways across that plane, so it had to take a very long time to do this. Uh, or they may have had a vehicle, I don't know. Uh, that's an assumption, I think, on my part. Uh, with the, the okay, so they're around with but the But they family. came across the, the planes, nonetheless. I, I'm not sure if they drove or not. I didn't hear any car. And then somebody else showed up. Yeah, they were down there just, oh, 15, maybe 20 minutes, the tops, you know. And they were picking up things, some of the students. and. This Dr. Buskirk, that they called him, this one girl went up and said, look, doctor, wouldn't this make a beautiful ring? And she was holding what looked like a, a red rod, uh, uh, a red tube of some kind. It was kind of a silvery red. And he kind of snapped at her, you know, and put that down, Agnes. You don't know what that is. I think it hurts you. Don't pick this stuff up. And she kind of said, well, yeah, okay, doctor. And then he went back to what he was doing, and she walked away and put it in her pocket. And a lot of them were doing this, sort of picking up things and feeling things. I was picking up things and feeling things. It was uh, all kinds of material and metal and stuff laying around. And then we heard it. I heard it. Well, we all heard it, a sound of a motor coming like a truck. And I went back up the, the incline there to the, to the ridge line, and I could see out there, and there was a, a truck coming up. It was an old pickup truck. It was sort of a, a, a beige color or a tan color thing. It had a whip antenna on it. And it stopped, and this guy got out, and he's wearing brown clothes. He's got boots on, and he's wearing a straw hat, just like the kind Harry Truman always wore. And he had wire rimmed glasses. He was a big man, and he looked exactly like Harry Truman to me. And I, you know, I'd seen in the movie tone news that the he was president then. <laughs> yeah, I, I was well aware who Harry Truman was, so everybody was. He was our, kind of a hero, you know. And this guy looked like him, except bigger, bigger. And I don't think he, and he didn't look as old either. Uh, his hair was uh, kind of uh, light gray. And uh, he walked over there, and they got to talking, you know, he, with everybody. And he told them that he worked out on the planes out there, and that he made maps, and that he had seen. The, the wreckage from out there on the planes, and he saw the people, and he thought it was a plane wreck, and he, you know, just something was going on, he came over there to see. And he hadn't been there but just a very, very few minutes when we heard all kinds of motors and, and engine straining and stuff. And uh, here comes a, a, a military car with a big white star on the side of it, followed by a six by, which is a, a military truck with a kind of a canvas wagon uh, type of canvas thing over it, and it's full of soldiers, they've got guns, and right behind that was what we call a 4 by which is like a, a medium-sized uh, Jeep truck situation, and it had two big high whip antennas, all kinds of radio gear in the back, and a guy back there with earphones and stuff on, it, and he's, you know, working these radios, and they all pulled up and stopped. And, uh, Which direction had they come from? Then? They came from, from the north, from Horse, the Horse Springs area, right? So they the could south. have come off the highway there. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's exactly how they got there. They come off the highway the same way we did. 
Well, in the meantime, the, when it stopped, the, this black soldier, the sergeant, and the reason I know he was a sergeant, my brother told me he was, and he got out of this, uh, this car, and then a guy got out on the other side, and he was, Glenn said he was a, he was a captain, he told me later he was a captain. And this guy had orange red hair. And uh, the, all the soldiers of them came running over there, pointing guns at people, and telling them, get away, get away, get away, you know. And when this creature saw these people, the military, he went nuts. He went into an absolute panic, worse than what he did when he saw us. Uh, did he move around, or just his eyes? Or? Uh, he, he just, he just oh, he went okay. crazy. And it was like he was looking Fearful. for, yeah, like a, like he was looking for a place to run and hide. But he never got up. Never got up. He never left the one injured one next to him. And uh, this redheaded officer, this guy was a real butthole. Uh, he made all the threats. He threatened to have people shot. They didn't move. To away. everybody. Oh yeah, get away, get away. You know, well, shoot, get away from there. This is a military secret. You know, just screaming and hollering. And he told my my uncle and my father that if they didn't want to spend the rest of their life in prison, they would never say anything about what they saw there. If they ever wanted to see us kids again, they'd take the kids away. And they'd never see the kids, you know, meaning me and, and Victor, that we'd better keep our mouths shut. If we did not, this is what was going to happen. Uh, they were threatening people and pushing people and the students as well and Dr. oh yeah they were, they were they were hustling everybody and one of the soldiers uh pushed my my uncle he had, he had a rifle i guess he shoved him back like that well that was something you don't do to my uncle ted uh, ted had a violent temper and he grabbed the rifle and reached over the top and smacked this guy and dropped him right there and ted had dropped the fight and dropped the hat this guy's a cowboy he, he, he'll hit you in a minute and of course when he did that bolts opened and I guess cocking, you know, they were cocking their rifles and they were pointing guns at people and uh, everybody, Buskirk and Glenn and Dad grabbed him, you know, pulled him back and got him away. Don't, don't, man, they're going to shoot, don't do that, you know, trying to stop this. And I think we came very close to having someone shot. Uh, then they really started threatening, you know, and they entered. You know, well, did the redhead do all the talking? Pretty much, uh, except once in a while the sergeant would, would you know, would chime in and, and make statements like that to other people in response to the redhead. But mainly it was the redheaded. Was there tag. a name tag? Yes, there was, and uh, his name was Armstrong. And I'm not sure if I know that from having read it or know that from remembering it. Now being able to read it in my memory, or if someone said that to me, but his name was Armstrong. Now they chased you guys away pretty quick. Yeah, yeah they did, and uh, they herded us up like cattle, and they moved us up to the Arroyo, back in the direction we come from, over the protest of this Dr. Busker who said, "No, no, we've got to go the other way. We came from. Over I don't care where you came from. Get your ass up the the uh, Arroyo," and they ran us up the Arroyo, and. Uh, so you get to your car then. Right. Now they take us up to Arroyo and just below the hill that we came down, they broke us off and moved us up the hill. Now this whole time, no one has ever frisked us down. No one has ever checked our pockets to see if we picked up any of this material. And this girl, Agnes, still has that stuff in her pocket and some of the other students had stuff. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, at the, up to that point, they had not been searched. Whether they did so afterward, I don't know. They never searched us, ever. They run us back up the hill, and uh, when we got to where the car was parked, where Daddy parked the car up there, there's a Jeep with a guy sitting in the back, and there's a mounted machine gun in the back of this Jeep, and all these soldiers. The Jeep pulls out. We're told to get in the car. We follow the Jeep, and the soldiers go with us all the way back out to the highway. When we get back out to the highway, they set us right there. They wouldn't let us out of the car. They wouldn't let us move forward. It was, I don't know whether they're making a decision or what. When we got out to the highway, this place was absolutely full of military personnel, military equipment. There was airplanes sitting out there that they had landed on the highway. 
Did you see any airplanes when you were back at the site? Yeah, there was airplanes in the sky, but nobody thought much about it. You know, I didn't think anything about it. I was used to airplanes being in the sky, having, you know, been raised in Indianapolis, Indiana, the home of the Northern bomb site. You know, the sky was always full of military aircraft. I never thought nothing about it. And when we get back onto the highway, there's observation aircraft, you know, high wing aircraft, and there's one, what I know now to be a C-47 sitting there. And how we didn't hear that lands beyond me. And how you land, well, of course, I guess you could land if you're a good pilot out there. There's no trouble no poles or anything. And it was, they had torn the fence down on the north side of that highway. And all this equipment was setting back up there, and that plane was up there, and they were taking stuff out of the plane. There was uh, military ambulances, and there was trucks with, uh, like, uh, uh, wreckers, cranes on them. And there was uh, tankers, like maybe had fuel or water in them. There was just, everywhere you looked, there was military. And A major recovery work. operation. Yeah, it looked like an invasion force. It really did. And they were all wearing these these light, light khaki uniforms. They didn't look like, you know, Ollie dress. They were light khaki and they all had the same patch over there, that kind of blue funny patch with the, the circles on it was, was on their shoulder. And a Did lot you have of any clue as to where they came from? Did your brother or your uncle? No, I, I don't know where they came from. Uh, I don't think anybody ever ascertained that. Um, there were a lot of them had MP patches and they were and some of them were wearing nightsticks off of these uh, Webbed utility belts. They had nightsticks and they had 45s and holsters. You know, the, the automatics in, in the full of the holster. And these were the people who were given most of the orders. They had the road barricaded off out there, and we sat there for a very long time. And you know, we were getting thirsty and everything. And we asked, you know, if we could go back to Horse Springs and get some water. Oh no, no, you can't go through there. And right after that, they said, No, you just turn around and you head out of here now, and you go to Socorro, and you and this is a redhead again. Keep your mouth shut, just keep going, and don't look back. Well, it, as we drove away, you know, Dad and him said, hell with it, we'll, get, we'll go to Magdalena, we'll get water in Magdalena, you know, because that's where John Trujillo lived, his relative was Ted. And uh, so as we drove away, I was looking out the back window, and I could see Dr. Buskert and these kids, and that guy that got out of the pickup was standing there, and this Dr. Buskirk was doing just like this in this red-headed officer's face, and he kept pointing back behind him. And I guess that meant, you know, we got to go back that way, and he was fed up with this guy or something, and he was shaking his finger in his face while they were yelling at each other. And that's pretty much the last I saw of the whole situation. I don't know what happened after that, because we just kept going. To summarize, the material recovered on the Brazel Ranch was highly unusual. The material was not from a weather balloon. The weather balloon explanation was a cover story. The discovery of the debris quickly got the attention of high-ranking officials in the military. The operation was highly classified. The media were intimidated by government officials. Civilians were threatened by the military. A craft was found at the Corona crash site. Bodies of aliens were found at the Corona site and were taken to the Roswell Army Airfield. A craft and aliens, both dead and alive, were found at the Plains of San Agustin crash site. The preponderance of evidence from multiple independent witnesses indicates that at least one unidentified flying object crashed in New Mexico in July 1947. The craft and the remains of non-human occupants were recovered by military personnel and transported under extreme secrecy to Wright Field and other locations for analysis. The results of that analysis are unknown.